Hey, how are you doing today? I hope you're having a fantastic day, like I am. Uh, it's been a long day, it's been a long couple of days. I've been driving uh, about 14 and a half hours yesterday, and so far about four or five hours today. I'm going from Texas up to Wyoming to look at a whole bunch of exciting rocks, and you're coming along with me. Anyway, I've got no place to go. It's I'm gonna be looking at a whole slew of things on this trip. I'm gonna be looking at pre-Cambrian rocks. I'm gonna be looking at Cambrian rocks. I'm gonna be looking at some Paleozoics, like the ones behind me. I'm gonna look at some Mesozoics. I'm even gonna look at some Cenozoic rocks. I mean, we're covering the whole column, because you can do that in Wyoming. You might be able to hear these really loud trucks and semis and things that are going by in the background. There's a lot of really nice road cuts here. Uh, which facilitate that kind of thing. So I'm going to be looking at road cuts. I'm going to be looking at some stuff off the beaten path. I'm going to be looking at stuff in the wilderness. A whole bunch of things. Let's start with this before we go any further though. It all of a sudden got really quiet here. So I'm going to take an opportunity that you don't normally get along the side of Highway 287 north of Fort Collins. I'm going to talk a little bit about the succession behind me. So this outcrop is Owl Canyon. And you can see it's a really nice canyon. I just drove through it coming from Fort Collins up through towards Laramie. And we're looking south right now, but we're also going up section. So all the rocks are kind of tilted in that direction. Meaning immediately behind me is this Pennsylvania Permian, what's called the Fountain Formation. The Fountain Formation, we'll take a look at it up close in a second, but it's a fairly coarse grained, arcosic, sandy member, uh, sandy formation. And it's interpreted as being fluvial systems, alluvial fans, uh, and maybe some uh, lagoonal deposits. Going up above it, we have what's creatively called the Owl Canyon Formation. Um, it's also called the Lion's Sandstone. There's the Satanka Shale, which is interpreted to be part of it, or part of the Goose Egg Formation. The nomenclature gets really squirrely in here, but basically it's the same age as the lower part of the goose egg formation and in a different video from earlier this year at glendo reservoir i walked you guys through the goose egg formation which has generally been interpreted as kind of a shallow marine sabka tidal flat environment but might also be uh better interpreted as a sort of saline lake environment so a really uh coastal playa that's not connected to the ocean so that's equivalent to the goose egg up here this is the fountain this is actually equivalent to um, the Casper Formation. And again, I did another video earlier this year around Laramie looking at the Casper. There's big Aeolian deposits, tidal deposits, um, and there's even some limestone in that. And there is some limestone up here. You can see that really strong ridge behind me in the Owl Canyon Formation. That's what looks like a carbonate, a limestone from here. So let's, as usual, start at the bottom. We're gonna walk away up through here, see what we see and just kind of do some interpretation along the way. All right, crossed the road very safely so as not to get splattered by a semi. Um, I'm on the north, south, east, western side of the highway. So I'm on the western side of Highway 287 and I jumped over here just to kind of give you a feel for the succession of that basal to middle to upper part of the fountain formation. And you can see here, there's kind of a repetition of cycles. You can see there's kind of the brick red, what looks like a, a brick red unit. And then you get kind of a, almost a pink salmon colored unit. Then a really dark kind of chocolatey brown red. Then back to the brick red, a little bit of salmon, brick red, some more salmon. So we're gonna run right across the street here, right across the highway and take a look at this kind of, it looks a little bit softer. It's not as jagged as the reddish materials, that kind of softer pink, and then that sort of jagged red. Okay, so we're approaching that sort of pillowy looking pink sand. And maybe even from there, you can see it's pretty coarse grained. And this is pretty heavy duty stuff. Look at this, there's cobbles. Um, it's very, very coarse grained, it's pebbly. There's big cobbles, there's pebbles, all different sizes, a whole variety of sizes and shapes and textures in here. There's also very clear stratification. There's cross bedding. And it's called cross bedding, you know, because it's bedding that's crossed. Uh, nothing tricky there. It's not parallel 
uh, horizontal laminated, it's at an angle. In this case, we can see good evidence of cross beds going one direction that way. There's another set up here going that way. Down here, you can see the cross beds are enhanced with maybe mud drapes, shale drapes. Look at this, this is interesting. This almost looks like a trace fossil, a burrow of some kind. Um, it could be, well, it could be a variety of things, but it could be a bivalve trace or something like that. But looking at this, what we would call lithophases, it's very coarse grain. It's got pebbles the size of that. It's got cross bedding. You can see a really nice set of cross beds right behind me there, as a matter of fact, going that way. And they're going north. Um, there's some more up here that are also going north. So the idea with this is we have coarse grained, high energy subaqueous dunes being constructed. That's what creates this cross bedding. Um, so it's really the slip face, the avalanche face of a subaqueous dune. Um, some people call them mega ripples. Technically, they're a dune, just like a snow drift or a sand dune. It's a fluid moving um, plastic debris and creating these three dimensional structures that we would call dunes if they're subaqueous or subaerial. So these are dunes going to the north. This is uh, like a quartz pebble. So there's quartz, there's all kinds of um, feldspar pebbles. And the pink color is a feldspar. So the pinkish color here is coming from feldspars. Um, there's orthoclase, plagioclase, the light color is quartz. There's a few mafics, not much. This is basically pummeled granite. So the color and the texture and the mineral composition is telling us that this is really just essentially granite that's been pulverized, eroded, weathered, accumulating as sand and gravel and then getting swept down by subaqueous processes to create these subaqueous dunes, which is consistent with an alluvial fan. So the interpretation as being an alluvial fan or a fluvial system, even with some little burrows like this, if it's maybe a bivalve living in there. So that's just kind of light colored salmon material. And we're gonna warp, continue our way up the outcrop and just see if they're all like this. I'm betting they will be all like this all these beds, but we're going to double check just to be sure. Next up is that kind of chocolate material. So let's get past our beautiful cross beds here and take a look at this. This is actually silty. It's not very coarse grain. So that kind of silty amorphous material is not a lot of bedding in here. Here's a coarse grained blob um, that looks a lot like this. It seems to just be an isolated blob. So that might be a ripped up chunk of this. This material here that's finer grained with occasional ripped up chunks of, of the host material of the, um, the underlying material along with this kind of wedge of a little bit better cemented dark material that's consistent with something that was deposited in an abandoned channel. Um, this layer kind of pinches out that way. It kind of pinches out this way. You can see behind me, it's got that sort of really clear pinch out that looks like a channel edge. So this kind of material very likely was deposited in an abandoned fluvial channel. So the main part of the channel is down here. These are the bars and the beds. When that channel started to give up the ghost, there's the abandoned phase, and it filled in with this finer grain material um, because it was subjected to lower energy. It was cut off from the main belt. So this is the active channel, and that's the main belt. And those are very loud semis. All right, we're gonna keep going up here. So I'm walking past what I'm interpreting as the abandoned channel here. You can see the active channel below is the pink. There's the abandoned channel, and you can see there's um, different embedded material in there. Uh, some of it has been kind of swirled around. Look at this, there's actually bedding in this. And what happens in these abandoned channels is during a big flood, during a very high energy flood, material is normally in the active channel will kind of sweep in 
and get deposited in the sort of ponded area. So you get these sandy bars, mini deltas, things like that in an abandoned channel. You can see it's kind of heterolithic down in here, meaning two types of lithology. There's the chocolate brown fine green, then the lighter colored coarse green, fine green, coarse green. So that kind of rhythmic cyclicity, not tidal. Uh, it's not that regular that you would think it's tidal deposits, but it's probably related to seasonal discharge in a fluvial system. High discharge during heavy rains, whether it's spring or winter, um, hard to tell. I should have mentioned the age on this. Um, we're looking at something that's probably over 350 million years old. So at this time, you know, we're in Pangaea, we're in a supercontinent that had really different climatic structure than we're used to today. Um, so it's still poorly understood exactly how climate worked on Pangaea on the supercontinent. Um, that's a whole other topic for a different discussion. But what is kind of interesting here is these little light green chlorite zones that are maybe indicative of rooting. Roots of plants when they come into these abandoned channel fills, really any kind of soil. The soil has a lot of free oxygen in it. That's why it's rusted. Where the roots are, it reduces the amount of oxygen and prevents rusting. So you get these kind of chloride bands. I mentioned that in a different video I was looking at um, down in, in Oklahoma in some of the Dockham formations. So you can, if you're really curious, take a look at that. So we've got active channel, abandoned channel, maybe some evidence of rooting. And then this face is up here. Let's get a better look at that. Okay, and finally, here's that bright brick red, kind of orangish red, cross-bedded sand. And we've seen this before. When I did a video, oh, I just sat on something really sharp. Yeah, so safety moment. If you're gonna sit and talk about an outcrop, don't sit on very sharp yuccas like that without looking. It really, really can hurt your butt. Okay, so take two after sitting on a sharp plant. This face is we've seen before in the Casper Formation up around Laramie on I-80. You can take a look at that video. I'll put a link in the description below. You can go take a look if you're curious. But if you look closely, it's alternating very, very fine, and then a little bit of coarser, and very, very fine, a little bit of coarser. We've also seen this around Moab. And I did a video on some of the aeolian deposits, some of the wind-blown deposits around Moab. And these coarser grain bits are very possibly grain flow uh, units that slip down the face of a dune. The very fine grain material is the background, um, very fine sand, and in some cases even silt. So that very, it's often called pinstriping, is very typical of aeolian faces, meaning wind-blown faces subaerial dunes. We've seen subaqueous dunes in a fluvial system. These are subaerial dunes in a desert. And you see the cross bedding behind me. You can see the bedding come all the way through behind me and down. Very large beds. The fluvial beds I showed you back there are only a couple inches tall, you know, 10, 20 centimeters. And they go, you know, a few feet. These guys are many feet tall, meters tall in a fluvial system. And the dunes in a fluvial system versus sub-aerial dunes, which tend to be a lot larger. And you can really see that pinstriping here. It's really very clear here, typical of, a, of an aeolian system. So just in this short little walk, <laughs> outcrop work is dangerous. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. In a short little walk, these three facies have kind of showed themselves to at least, for my interpretation, and you know, hopefully you agree, uh, that we've got the very coarse grain pink salmon color material is a fluvial channel system. There's abandoned channel deposits. Um, could even be like little inter, inter channel, inter dune ponds. They've got some roots. They've got some fine grain material with occasional coarse grain material being dumped in. And then there's this very fine grain pinstriped, typical of an Aeolian system. So we're in a pretty arid setting here. Uh, just like today. But this is even more arid. This would probably be more like the skeleton coast in Africa where you have big coastal dunes, little wadis and fluvial systems, um, and abandoned channels or, or ponds in between. So the fountain formation continues on up that way. We're gonna walk it out. As we're walking with all the traffic going by, 
it's worth thinking of the three dimensional world today and how that would be preserved in four dimensions. So you look and see these, these little tongues of pink material, remnants of a little fluvial challenge, interfingering with this Aeolian deposit, which is typical in a system that's kind of shifting back and forth, back and forth over time, like these things do. I just spotted something else too. Here is a perfect borehole. Somebody's taking a little core plug. Um, there's another one over here. So somebody was doing uh, some sort of rock analysis. Commonly, you drill in, take a plug out, and then you're looking at things like porosity, permeability, mineral composition, uh, cementation. Pro tip, free of charge from me to you. If you're gonna take a core sample of a rock, presumably for using it in subsurface interpretation of the rock at subsurface, Maybe you're looking at carbon storage. Maybe you're looking at oil and gas potential, the aquifer potential. This rock here has been sitting on the surface for millennia, possibly millions of years, eroding, weathering, dissolving, right? Rainwater is slightly acidic. There's been all sorts of uh, bacteriological interaction with this rock. So this rock has been severely weathered compared to its state in the subsurface, meaning, Whatever results you get from this core plug might be pretty close to useless for whatever you're trying to do in the subsurface. It might give you an idea of the mineralogy and the rough grain size and cross bedding and stuff. But in terms of porosity permeability, uh, which changes as things are compacted in subsurface and as minerals are dissolved, uh, this probably is not going to be super helpful. You know, there's been a lot of studies done on outcrops that they then try to drag into the subsurface for uh, for hydrocarbons and carbon storage and all that sort of uh, business. And and if you're doing it this way, you got to be really careful because I don't know, it might not be telling you what you think it's saying. All right, enough. I'll get off my soapbox. We'll keep looking at rocks. So still walking by that Aeolian faces, that windblown faces. And it looks like this was really interesting to somebody. Somebody was doing a lot of drilling and pulling out core plugs. It's kind of funny, a lot of times sampling like this, they always sample the best rock, what they think is the best rock. Um, so it's not random. It doesn't give you a really good feel for what's actually distributed. If you're selectively picking the best samples, that gives you a skewed interpretation of what's happening. Anyway, enough of that. For some reason, the traffic comes in really discreet spurts, and it's almost always when I start talking. As soon as I shut this damn camera off, there's gonna be no cars. It's incredible. This is that last gasp of the fluvial system up towards the top. Sure enough, somebody took some core plugs from it. They got the really coarse grain faces, at least. Um, over here, they got sort of the finer. They ignored the finest. That's interesting. And finally, back into the sort of uh, what looks like Aeolian, maybe a little bit of, of uh, abandoned channel, or like I keep saying, it could be like a little uh, uh, playa, little interchannel or interdune pond, that chocolate material. They're not mutually exclusive. Same faces can fill in an abandoned channel and a little ephemeral pond. They're both quiet water. Speaking of quiet, hey, how about that? The traffic's really subsided. And finally, a good swath of the Aeolian, brick red, orange red, whatever you want to call it, faces. So I'll wander down and take a look at the Owl Canyon formation, and I'll wrap it up. We'll continue heading north. So you can really see the nature of the outcrop here. Plus, it's quiet because the cars have quit for a second. There's the fountain formation, ridge forming sandstone of varying grain size. Then we get into the Owl Canyon, and there's this sort of heavily covered section which is probably fine grain material, uh, probably silts, maybe some mudstones. Then there's the carbonate on the surface. And that carbonate up at the very top dips down into the canyon itself. So we're gonna look at the carbonate for sure. And we'll see if any of this stuff, this, uh, this covered material sticks out. We might get lucky and be able to see something. Maybe, I don't know, there's no promises. You get what you pay for in these videos. These are what's called plumos fractures because they look like a plume. They almost look like an ostrich feather. And they happen in really well um, 
brittle, well-consolidated, brittle rocks. So things like carbonates, things like really well-cemented um, sandstones, they're very, very fine-grained. Um, but carbonates especially are prone to that kind of fracturing. So these plumose structures, these plumose fractures, um, together with just, you can see, um, the lack of clear grains in this. This is a limestone. I should have brought acid. We could have dropped acid on this and woohoo, party. Uh, we would have seen it fizz. You drop hydrochloric acid and it interacts with the calcium carbonate and fizzes and creates carbon dioxide and makes a nice little uh, fizzy action. So this is a limestone with that characteristic plumose fracturing sitting on top of the sandy face here. So we're in our transgressive phase here into the Owl Canyon formation. So I was just standing down there at the base of the cliff and looking at that transition from the clastic to the carbonate. And you can see it's kind of going back and forth, back and forth. You can tell by the color change, the kind of orangish material is the sandy clastics. The kind of grayish pink is the carbonate. So we're going one cycle of transgression, then it regresses as coastline builds back out. And then look at that, there's another transgression with that gray carbonate. And then another build out of those sands. And then another transgression with the carbonate. So we've actually got one cycle, two cycle, three cycle. So we've got at least three or maybe four cycles of transgression to regression, which is pretty typical in an environment like this. Um, we got to remember this is probably an ice house climate, just like today. So there was glaciers, sea level was going up and down because of glaciation, but also down that way, down south in Colorado, let's not forget we have the ancestral Rockies building up and they're the source for a lot of these clastics. So that granite that I was talking about before, the pulverized granite that's providing the sand and gravel is actually coming from the ancestral Rockies down in uh, Denver and Fort Collins area. It's only about 60 to 120 miles south of us. So those things moving around would affect sea level just as much as glaciation. So we have tectonics, we have glacial used to see, all kinds of exciting things happening. So I'm just walking along some more. Um, we're getting up to the top of that last cycle I just pointed out. And it seems to dip down across the way and have some more sand on top. So we'll get to the limits of the outcrop, because hey, how often do you get a chance to stop and look at something like this? Um, we might as well look at the whole thing. Here's the top of one of those transgressive cycles. And look at that, oh, look at that surface. That is super sharp. We gotta take a look at that up close. That is a super sharp surface of clastic on carbonate. Okay, we're checking this out. It's always exciting when you see something like this. Oh man, yeah, look at it. Somebody's really, they've been plugging the hell out of it, going nuts in the carbonate. But look at this, look at this surface. Holy cow. That's what I would call a sharp surface. That's what I would call an abrupt surface. Okay, so this is a great chance to kind of talk about what I was just babbling about with sea level. You know, sea level going up and down can happen because glaciers are melting. When glaciers melt, sea level rises. When glaciers are forming, sea level falls. You could also do that with tectonics. If the mountain range to the south, the ancestral Rockies, is moving up and down, it's taking this land with it and dumping sediment in. So you can imagine in a bathtub, if you start pushing blocks of wood up and down, it's gonna change relative sea level on those blocks of wood and in the tub itself, you push them down and so on. This is a very sharp, sharp surface. This is abrupt as they come. This is carbonate, this is limestone. We are swimming around offshore Bahamas. Snorkel gear, diving gear. This is Aeolian. This is like Skeleton Coast dune field. That surface between them is sharp as can be. There's no gradual shallowing up of the carbonate. Instead, we have offshore carbonates, sharp surface, and whammo, Aeolian dune. This is what a lot of times we call an unconformity. Probably more accurate to call it a discontinuity or disconformity. Um, and unconformity usually implies there's some sort of angular uh, discordance. It's hard to tell here whether or not this has that. It might not, but it's unconformable in the sense that we don't have a normal succession of deposits going from offshore to nearshore to onshore. Instead, we're going from offshore, whack, to onshore. And that's probably a result of glaciation. So what very well might have happened here 
is this was an interglacial phase and we had a lot of warm tropical carbonate seas. And then as the glacier started to form, remember as a glacier forms, it's building up ice. That ice is coming from water precipitated out of the ocean. Sea levels will fall. That's what happened 100,000 years ago up to about 10,000 years ago. Sea levels were a lot lower than they are today because the glaciers were all over North America, Europe, and so on. As they melted, sea levels rising. So at this time, if glaciers were forming and dropping sea level, you would have been exposing these carbonate banks fairly rapidly, and the result would have been aeolian dunes blasting out on top of them as this material weathers. And there would have been storm waves acting on them and tidal waves and so on and so forth. Uh, so there have been a lot of processes eroding this material. Um, but it's mostly a result of sea level falling abruptly and creating a truncation. So this is a potential unconformity. You could also call it a sequence boundary. And that's a topic for a whole nother conversation, but this could be a sequence boundary. In fact, it most likely is. Um, and that's synonymous with an unconformity. It's a regional unconformity that occurs in a succession of rocks like this. So in other words, what should be a predictive succession is interrupted by something atypical. And that's pretty damned atypical. So that's cool. All right. Wow. Bonus points for spotting an unconformity sequence boundary right here, right off Highway 287, right behind me. If you're ever in the neighborhood, check it out. It's really highly recommended. Would do again, five stars. I'm gonna walk up to the top of the outcrop and then we'll call it a day. Okay, this is it. This is the top of the outcrop. This is the top of the Owl Canyon formation here. And it's again, that kind of orangish, brick red orange sandstone. So again, with the sort of Aeolian you can see the big cross beds in it. You can see that cross bedding is very big and very obvious, um, feet tall, consistent with Aeolian. Could be other things. It could also be um, big fluvial systems, could be big subaqueous dunes. Um, but let's take a look and see if there's anything in the, the structure. Um, the sedimentary structure is the grain size or the textures that tell us is it one or the other. It might not be too easy to tell, but we'll give it a shot. As I'm walking up, you can really see each of these lineations is an accretion set on a large macro form, a large dune. So these represent avalanche faces of either a subaqueous or a subaerial dune. Um, and it looks like pretty planar lamination in there. So there's no cross bedding. If it's a huge subaqueous dune, it might just be avalanching straight down the dune face. Um, that seems to be the case here. Whatever it is, is avalanching straight down the dune face, straight down the dune face, straight. So you keep getting avalanches of material. Um, looks like some of it is a little bit coarser than the rest. Yeah, see, there's like some coarser grain material in here. So this could be subaqueous. Uh, it could be a big fluvial or, or tidal dune or tidal bar you have to really get in and see if we see any like grain flow grain fall this is interesting this looks like ripped up chunks of of carbonate maybe and here's what i was talking about here's one set of sand one accretionary body but within it there's accretionary laminate you can actually see laminate in here and they're all going to the north so this is a single dune um, made up of these slip faces going that direction so this thing behind me is a composite feature it's a composite of, of several of these dunes kind of piled up one on the other which is interesting um, so it might be a fluvial bar might be a tidal bar um, really hard to tell from a single outcrop look at that there's some nice little four sets again going north so this is like what we saw in that fluvial system back there so i'm kind of inclined to say this might actually be uh, a larger scale fluvial system with some compound dunes um, building out to the north so that's the top of the owl canyon formation beyond us there's not much um, there's another road that actually drives through owl canyon it's a shortcut to laramie so if you don't feel like taking 287 that way, you can take that. It looks like there's an RV taking it right now. Uh, it gets kind of dicey, but 287 is right back here. So just to summarize what we just walked through, um, it's a succession of Pennsylvanian to Permian through Permian, um, 
Fountain Formation, Owl Creek Formation. We saw it goes from largely aeolian and fluvial to increasingly marine, with some transgressions and some carbonates being deposited in the Permian. Then we have a really beautiful sequence boundary and unconformity up towards the top of that succession where the carbonates were all of a sudden truncated by aeolian dunes. Good evidence that glacial used to see 4 sea level down or something was happening tectonics wise with the front range or a combination of both. Glacial used to see in the tectonics, influencing sea level here, forcing it down. And then up towards the top of this unit here, we have Again, the marine carbonate yielding to what's behind me, some sort of subaqueous dunes, compound dunes. Uh, compound dunes are fairly common in tidal environments. Uh, again, that's topic for a whole nother conversation. I'm gonna be doing a video on that at another outcrop further to the north in northwestern Wyoming. So I know you're not gonna to wanna to miss that. Uh, but compound dunes like this are common in tidal systems. So behind me, this could actually be a big tidal dune field sitting on top of the marine carbonate field. It's a hypothesis. You would have to actually spend more time than I just did looking through this rock unit. I spent a few minutes walking along the side of the highway on my drive north. Um, I'm sure there's been a lot more work done in here. In fact, I know there has been. I just haven't looked at it recently because, you know, reasons. But hopefully, um, you know, I gave you some idea of how you would go through and interpret a succession. Like some of the things to look for in terms of like uh, sedimentary structures, grain size, color changes, texture changes, straddle surfaces and how they connect or don't connect to each other i don't know what else i could say about this so i'm gonna keep driving north you stay tuned and thank you very much for watching